Hernan Cortes. Hernan Cortes de Manroy y Pizarro, first Marquis of the Valley of Oaxaca was a Spanish conquistador who led an expedition that caused the fall of the Aztec Empire and brought large portions of mainland Mexico under the rule of the King of Castile in the early 16th century. Cortes was part of the generation of Spanish colonizers that began the first phase of the Spanish colonization of the Americas. Born in Medellin, Spain, to a family of lesser nobility, Cortes chose to pursue a livelihood in the New World. He went to Hispaniola and later to Cuba, where he received an encomienda and, for a short time, became alcalde, magistrate, of the second Spanish town founded on the island. In 1519, he was elected captain of the third expedition to the mainland, an expedition which he partly funded. His enmity with the governor of Cuba, Diego Velazquez de Cuela, resulted in the recall of the expedition at the last moment, an order which Cortés ignored. Arriving on the continent, Cortés executed a successful strategy of allying with some indigenous people against others. He also used a native woman, Doña Marina, as an interpreter. She would later bear Cortés a son. When the governor of Cuba sent emissaries to arrest Cortés, he fought them and won, using the extra troops as reinforcements. Cortés wrote letters directly to the king asking to be acknowledged for his successes instead of punished for mutiny. After he overthrew the Aztec Empire, Cortés was awarded the title of Marx del Valdeo Axaca, while the more prestigious title of Viceroy was given to a high-ranking nobleman. Antonio de Mendoza. In 1541 Cortés returned to Spain, where he died peacefully but embittered, six years later. Because of the controversial undertakings of Cortés and the scarcity of reliable sources of information about him, it has become difficult to assert anything definitive about his personality and motivations. Early lionizing of the conquistadors did not encourage deep examination of Cortés. Later reconsideration of the conquistador's character in the context of modern anti-colonial sentiment also did little to expand understanding of Cortés as an individual. As a result of these historical trends, descriptions of Cortés tend to be simplistic, and either damning or idealizing. Name While he is often now referred to as Herman or Hernando Cortés, IPA, in his time, he called himself Hernando or Fernando Cortes. The names Hernan, Hernando, and Fernando are all equally correct. The latter two were most commonly used during his lifetime, but the former shortened form has become common in both the Spanish and English languages in modern times, and is the name by which many people know him today. Early Life Cortes was born in 1485 in the town of Medellin, in modern-day Extremadura, Spain. His father, Martin Cortés de Monroy, born in 1449 to Rodrigo or Fernández de Monroy and his wife Maria Cortés, was an infantry captain of distinguished ancestry but slender means. Hernán's mother was Catalina Pizarro Altamirano. Through his mother, Hernán was the second cousin once removed of Francisco Pizarro, who later conquered the Inca Empire of modern-day Peru not to be confused with another Francisco Pizarro who joined Cortés to conquer the Aztecs, through her parents Diego Altamirano and wife and cousin Leonor Sánchez Pizarro Altamirano, first cousin of Pizarro's father. Through his father, Hernán was a twice-distant relative of Nicolás de Ovando, the third governor of Hispaniola. His paternal grandfather was a son of Rodrigo de Monroy y Almaraz, fifth lord of Monroy, and wife Mencia de Orellana y Carvajal. Hernan Cortés is described as a pale, sickly child by his biographer, chaplain, and friend Francisco López de Gomara. At the age of 14, Cortés was sent to study Latin under an uncle-in-law in Salamanca. After two years, Cortés, tired of schooling, returned home to Medellín, much to the irritation of his parents, who had hoped to see him equipped for a profitable legal career. However, those two years at Salamanca, plus his long period of training and experience as a notary, first in Seville and later in Hispaniola, would give him a close acquaintance with the legal codes of Castile that helped him to justify his unauthorized conquest of Mexico. At this point in his life, 
Cortez was described by Gomara as restless, haughty and mischievous. This was probably a fair description of a 16-year-old boy who had returned home only to find himself frustrated by life in his small provincial town. By this time, news of the exciting discoveries of Christopher Columbus in the New World was streaming back to Spain. Departure for the New World Plans were made for Cortés to sail to the Americas with a family acquaintance and distant relative, Nicolás de Ovando, the newly appointed governor of Hispania, currently Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but an injury he sustained while hurriedly escaping from the bedroom of a married woman from Medellín prevented him from making the journey. Instead, he spent the next year wandering the country, probably spending most of his time in the heady atmosphere of Spain's southern ports of Cadiz, Palos. San Lucar, and Seville, listening to the tales of those returning from the Indies, who told of discovery and conquest, gold, Indians, and strange unknown lands. He finally left for Hispaniola in 1504 where he became a colonist. Arrival Cortes reached Hispaniola in a ship commanded by Alonso Quintero, who tried to deceive his superiors and reach the New World before them in order to secure personal advantages. Quintero's mutinous conduct may have served as a model for Cortés in his subsequent career. The history of the conquistadors is rife with accounts of rivalry, jockeying for positions, mutiny, and betrayal. Upon his arrival in 1504 in Santo Domingo, the capital of Hispaniola, the 18-year-old Cortés registered as a citizen, which entitled him to a building plot and land to farm. Soon afterwards, Nicolás de Ovando, still the governor, gave him an encomienda and made him a notary of the town of Azua de Compostela. His next five years seemed to help establish him in the colony. In 1506, Cortés took part in the conquest of Hispaniola and Cuba, receiving a large estate of land and Indian slaves for his efforts from the leader of the expedition. Cuba 1511-1518 In 1511, Cortés accompanied Diego Velázquez de Cuela and aid the governor of Hispania, in his expedition to conquer Cuba. Velázquez was appointed as governor. At the age of 26, Cortés was made clerk to the treasurer with the responsibility of ensuring that the crown received the quinto, or customary one-fifth of the profits from the expedition. The governor of Cuba, Diego Velázquez, was so impressed with Cortés that he secured a high political position for him in the colony. He became secretary for Governor Velázquez. Cortés was twice appointed municipal magistrate, Alcalde, of Santiago. In Cuba, Cortés became a man of substance with an encomienda to provide Indian labor for his mines and cattle. This new position of power also made him the new source of leadership, which opposing forces in the colony could then turn to. In 1514, Cortés led a group which demanded that more Indians be assigned to the settlers. As time went on, relations between Cortés and Governor Velázquez became strained. This began once news of Juan de Grijalva, establishing a colony on the mainland where there was a bonanza of silver and gold, reached Velázquez. It was decided to send him help. Cortés was appointed Captain General of this new expedition in October 1518 but was advised to move fast before Velázquez changed his mind. With Cortés's experience as an administrator, knowledge gained from many failed expeditions, and his impeccable rhetoric he was able to gather six ships and three hundred men, within a month. Predictably, Velázquez's jealousy exploded and decided to place the leadership of the expedition in other hands. However, Cortés quickly gathered more men and ships in other Cuban ports. Cortés also found time to become romantically involved with Catalina Xuérez, or Juárez, the sister-in-law of Governor Velázquez. Part of Velázquez's displeasure seems to have been based on a belief that Cortés was trifling with Catalina's affections. Cortés was temporarily distracted by one of Catalina's sisters but finally married Catalina, reluctantly, under pressure from Governor Velázquez. However, by doing so, he hoped to secure the goodwill of both her family and that of Velázquez. It was not until he had been almost fifteen years in the Indies, 
that Cortes began to look beyond his substantial status as mayor of the capital of Cuba and as a man of affairs in the thriving colony. He missed the first two expeditions, under the orders of Francisco Hernández de Córdoba and then Juan de Grijalva, sent by Diego Velázquez to Mexico in 1518. Conquest of Mexico 1518-1520 in 1518 Velázquez put him in command of an expedition to explore and secure the interior of Mexico for colonization. At the last minute, due to the old gripe between Velázquez and Cortés, he changed his mind and revoked his charter. Cortés ignored the orders and went ahead anyway, in February 1519, in an act of open mutiny. Accompanied by about 11 ships, 500 men, 13 horses and a small number of cannons, he landed in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mayan territory. There, he encountered Geronimo de Aguila, a Spanish Franciscan priest who had survived a shipwreck and a period in captivity of the local Maya before escaping. Aguila had learned the Contal Maya language during his captivity, and could thus translate for Cortes. In March 1519, Cortes formally claimed the land for the Spanish crown. He stopped in Trinidad to hire more soldiers and obtain more horses. Then he proceeded to Tabasco, where he met with resistance and won a battle against the natives. He received twenty young indigenous women from the vanquished natives and he converted them all to Christianity. Among these women was La Malinche, his future mistress and mother of his child Martin. Malinche knew both the Nahuatl language and Contal Maya thus enabling Cortés to communicate with the Aztecs via Aguila. Through La Malinche, Cortés learned from the Tabascans about the wealthy Aztec Empire. In July 1519, his men took over Veracruz. By this act, Cortés dismissed the authority of the governor of Cuba to place himself directly under the orders of King Charles. In order to eliminate any ideas of retreat, Cortés scuttled his ships. March on Tenochtitlan. In Veracruz, he met some of the tributaries of the Aztecs and asked them to arrange a meeting with Moctezuma II, the Tlatorni, ruler, of the Aztec Empire. Moctezuma repeatedly turned down the meeting, but Cortes was determined. Leaving a hundred men in Veracruz, Cortes marched on Tenochtitlan in mid August 1519, along with 600 men, 15 horsemen, 15 cannons and hundreds of indigenous carriers and warriors. On the way to Tenochtitlan, Cortés made alliances with indigenous peoples such as the Nahuas of Tlaxcala, the Tlaxcalc, who had surrounded the Spanish and about 2,000 porters on a hilltop in the Totonacs of Sampola. In October 1519, Cortés and his men, accompanied by about 3,000 Tlaxcalteca, marched to Colula, the second largest city in central Mexico. Cortes either in a premeditated effort to instill fear upon the Aztecs waiting for him at Tenochtitlan or, as he later claimed when under investigation, wishing to make an example when he feared native treachery, massacred thousands of unarmed members of the nobility gathered at the central plaza, then partially burned the city. By the time he arrived in Tenochtitlan the Spaniards had a large army. On November 8, 1519, they were peacefully received by Moctezuma II. Moctezuma deliberately let Cortés enter the Aztec capital, the island city of Tenochtitlan, hoping to get to know their weaknesses better and to crush them later. Moctezuma gave lavish gifts of gold to the Spaniards which, rather than placating them, excited their ambitions for plunder. In his letters to King Charles, Cortés claimed to have learned at this point that he was considered by the Aztecs to be either an emissary of the feathered serpent god Quetzalcoatl or Quetzalcoatl himself a belief which has been contested by a few modern historians. But quickly Cortés learned that several Spaniards on the coast had been killed by Aztecs while supporting the Totonacs, and decided to take Moctezuma as a hostage in his own palace, indirectly ruling Tenochtitlan through him. Meanwhile, Valesquez sent another expedition, led by Panfilo de Narvaez, to oppose Cortés, arriving in Mexico in April 1520 with 1,100 men. Cortés left 200 men in Tenochtitlan and took the rest to confront Narvaez. He overcame Narvaez, despite his numerical inferiority, and convinced the rest of Narvaez's men to join him. In Mexico, 
one of Cortez's lieutenants Pedro de Alvarado, committed the massacre in the main temple, triggering a local rebellion. Cortez speedily returned to Tenochtitlan. On July 1, 1520 Moctezuma was killed, the Spaniards claimed he was stoned to death by his own people. Other claim he was murdered by the Spanish once they realized his inability to placate the locals. Faced with a hostile population, Cortes decided to flee for Tlaxcala. During the Noche Triste, June 1, 30 July 1520, the Spaniards managed a narrow escape from Tenochtitlan across the Tlacopan Causeway, while their backguard was being massacred. Much of the treasure looted by Cortes was lost, as well as his artillery, during this panicked escape from Tenochtitlan. Destruction of Tenochtitlan After a battle in Otumba, they managed to reach Tlaxcala, having lost 870 men. With the assistance of their allies, Cortes's men finally prevailed with reinforcements arriving from Cuba. Cortes began a policy of attrition towards Tenochtitlan, cutting off supplies and subduing the Aztecs' allied cities. The siege of Tenochtitlan ended with Spanish victory and the destruction of the city. In January 1521, Cortes countered a conspiracy against him, headed by Antonio de Villafana, who was hanged for the offense. Finally, with the capture of Karatemuk, the Tlatorni, ruler, of Tenochtitlan, on August 13, 1521, the Aztec Empire disappeared, and Cortes was able to claim it for Spain, thus renaming the city Mexico City. From 1521 to 1524, Cortes personally governed Mexico. Appointment to Governorship of Mexico and Internal Dissensions Many historical sources have conveyed an impression that Cortes was unjustly treated by the Spanish crown, and that he received nothing but ingratitude for his role in establishing New Spain. This picture is the one Cortes presents in his letters and in the later biography written by Gomara. However, there may be more to the picture than this. Cortes's own greed and vanity may have played a part in his deteriorating position with the king. King Charles appointed Cortes as governor, captain general and chief justice of the newly conquered territory, dubbed New Spain of the Ocean Sea. But also, much to the dismay of Cortes, four royal officials were appointed at the same time to assist him in his governing, in effect, submitting him to close observation and administration. Cortes initiated the construction of Mexico City, destroying Aztec temples and buildings and then rebuilding on the Aztec ruins what soon became the most important European city in the Americas. Cortes managed the founding of new cities and appointed men to extend Spanish rule to all of New Spain, imposing the Encomienda Land Tenure System in 1524. He also supported efforts to evangelize the indigenous people to Christianity and sponsored new explorations. He then spent the next seven years establishing peace among the Indians of Mexico and developing mines and farmlands. Cortes was one of the first Spaniards to attempt to grow sugar in Mexico and one of the first to import African slaves to early colonial Mexico. At the time of his death his estate contained at least 200 slaves who were either native Africans or of African descent. In 1523, the crown, possibly influenced by Cortes's enemy, Bishop Fonseca, sent a military force under the command of Francisco de Garay to conquer and settle the northern part of Mexico, the region of Panuco. This was another setback for Cortes who mentioned this in his fourth letter to the king in which he describes himself as the victim of a conspiracy by his archenemies Diego Velazas de Cuela, Diego Columbus and Bishop Fonseca as well as Francisco Garay. The influence of Garay was effectively stopped by this appeal to the king who sent out a decree forbidding Garay to interfere in the politics of New Spain, causing him to give up without a fight. From 1524 to 1526, Cortes headed an expedition to Honduras where he defeated Cristobal de Olid, who had claimed Honduras as his own under the influence of the governor of Cuba Diego Velazquez. Fearing that Canotemoc might head an insurrection in Mexico. He brought him with him in Honduras and hanged him during the journey. Raging over Olid's treason, Cortes issued a decree to arrest Velazquez, whom he was sure was behind Olid's treason. This, however, only served to further estrange the Crown of Castile and the Council of Indies, 
both of which were already beginning to feel anxious about Cortés's rising power. Cortés's fifth letter to King Charles attempts to justify his conduct, concludes with a bitter attack on various and powerful rivals and enemies, who have obscured the eyes of your majesty. Charles, who was also Holy Roman Emperor, had little time for distant colonies, much of Charles's reign was taken up with wars with France, the German Protestants and the expanding Ottoman Empire, except in so far as they contributed to finance his wars. In 1521, year of the conquest, Charles was attending to matters in his German domains and Bishop Adrian of Utrecht functioned as regent in Spain. Velazes and Fonseca persuaded the regent to appoint a commissioner with powers, a Jewish de residencia, Luis Ponce de Leon, to investigate Cortés's conduct and even arrest him. Cortés was once quoted as saying that it was more difficult to contend against, his, own countrymen than against the Aztecs. Governor Diego Velazes continued to be a thorn in his side, teaming up with Bishop Juan Rodríguez de Fonseca, chief of the Spanish colonial department, to undermine him in the Council of the Indies. A few days after Cortés's return from his expedition, Ponce de Leon suspended Cortés from his office of governor of New Spain. The licentiate then fell ill and died shortly after his arrival, appointing Marcos de Aguila as Alcalde mayor. The aged Aguila also became sick and appointed Alonso de Estrada governor, who was confirmed in his functions by royal decree in August 1527. Cortés, suspected of poisoning them, refrained from taking over the government. Estrada sent Diego de Figueroa to the south. De Figueroa raided graveyards and extorted contributions, meeting his end when the ship carrying these treasures sank. Albornoz persuaded Alonso de Estrada to release Salazar and Quirinos. When Cortés complained angrily after one of his adherents' hand was cut off, Estrada ordered him exiled. Cortés sailed for Spain in 1528 to appeal to King Charles. First return to Spain 1528 In 1528, Cortés returned to Spain to appeal to the justice of his master, Charles V. Juan Altamirano and Alonso Valiant stayed in Mexico and acted as Cortés' representatives during his absence. Cortés presented himself with great splendor before Charles V.'s court. By this time Charles had returned and Cortés forthrightly responded to his enemy's charges. Denying he had held back on gold due the crown, he showed that he had contributed more than the quinto, one-fifth, required. Indeed, he had spent lavishly to rebuild Notitlan, damaged during the siege that brought down the Aztec Empire. He was received by Charles with every distinction, and decorated with the Order of Santiago. In return for his efforts in expanding the still young Spanish Empire, Cortés was rewarded in 1529 by being named the Marx del Val de Oaxaca, Marquis of the Oaxaca Valley, a noble title and seigneurial estate which was passed down to his descendants until 1811. The Oaxaca Valley was one of the wealthiest region of New Spain, and Cortés had 23,000 vassals. Although confirmed in his land holdings and vassals, he was not reinstated as governor and was never again given any important office in the administration of New Spain. During his travel to Spain, his property was mismanaged by abusive colonial administrators. He sided with local natives in a lawsuit. The natives documented the abuses in the Huixot Zinco Codex. Return to Mexico Cortés returned to Mexico in 1530 with new titles and honors, but with diminished power. Although Cortés still retained military authority and permission to continue his conquests, Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza was appointed in 1535 to administer New Spain's civil affairs. This division of power led to continual dissension, and caused the failure of several enterprises in which Cortés was engaged. On returning to Mexico, Cortés found the country in a state of anarchy. There was a strong suspicion in court circles of an intended rebellion by Cortés, and a charge was brought against him that cast a fatal blight upon his character and plans. He was accused of murdering his first wife. The proceedings of the investigation were kept secret. No report either exonerating or condemning Cortés, was published. Had the government declared him innocent, it would have greatly increased his popularity. 
had it declared him a criminal, a crisis would have been precipitated by the accused and his party. Silence was the only safe policy, but that silence is suggestive that grave danger was feared from his influence. After reasserting his position and re-establishing some sort of order, Cortes retired to his estates at Cuernavaca, about 30 miles, 48 kilometers, south of Mexico City. There he concentrated on the building of his palace and on Pacific exploration. Remaining in Mexico between 1530 and 1541, Cortes quarreled with Nuno Beltran de Guzman and disputed the right to explore the territory that is today California with Antonio de Mendoza, the first viceroy. In 1536, Cortes explored the northwestern part of Mexico and discovered the Baja California Peninsula. Cortes also spent time exploring the Pacific coast of Mexico. The Gulf of California was originally named the Sea of Cortes by its discoverer Francisco de Ulloa in 1539. This was the last major expedition by Cortes. Later Life and Death Second Return to Spain After his exploration of Baja California, Cortes returned to Spain in 1541, hoping to confound his angry civilians, who had brought many lawsuits against him, for debts, abuse of power, etc. On his return he was utterly neglected, and could scarcely obtain an audience. On one occasion he forced his way through a crowd that surrounded the emperor's carriage, and mounted on the footstep. The emperor, astounded at such audacity, demanded of him who he was. I am a man, replied Cortes proudly who has given you more provinces than your ancestors left you cities. Expedition against Algiers The emperor finally permitted Cortes to join him and his fleet commanded by Andrea Doria at the great expedition against Algiers in the Barbary coast in 1541, which was then part of the Ottoman Empire and was used as a base by Herod in Barbarossa, a famous Turkish kasser and admiral-in-chief of the Ottoman fleet. During this unfortunate campaign, which was his last, Cortes was almost drowned in a storm that hit his fleet while he was pursuing Barbarossa. Last Years and Legacy Having spent a great deal of his own money to finance expeditions, he was now heavily in debt. In February 1544 he made a claim on the royal treasury, but was given a royal runaround for the next three years. Disgusted, he decided to return to Mexico in 1547. When he reached Seville, he was stricken with dysentery. He died in Castilla de la Cuesta, Seville province, on December 2, 1547, from a case of pleurisy at the age of 62. Like Columbus, he died a wealthy but embittered man. He left his many mestizo and white children well cared for in his will, along with every one of their mothers. He requested in his will that his remains eventually be buried in Mexico. Before he died he had the Pope remove the natural status of three of his children, legitimizing them in the eyes of the Church, including Martin, the son he had with Doña Marina, also known as La Malinche, said to be his favorite. After his death his body has been moved more than eight times for several reasons. On December 4, 1547 he was buried in the mausoleum of the Duke of Medina in the church of San Isidro del Campo, Sevilla. Three years later, 1550, due to the space being required by the Duke, his body was moved to the altar of Santa Catarina in the same church. In his testament, Cortes asked for his body to be buried in the monastery he had ordered to be built in Coyoacan in Mexico, ten years after his death, but the monastery was never built. So in 1566, his body was sent to New Spain and buried in the church of San Francisco de Texcoco, where his mother and one of his sisters were buried. In 1629, Don Pedro Cortes IV Marquez del Val, his last male descendant, died, so the viceroy decided to move the bones of Cortes along with those of his descendant to the Franciscan church in Mexico. This was delayed for nine years while his body stayed in the main room of the palace of the viceroy. Eventually it was moved to the Cedrario of Franciscan Church, where it stayed for 87 years. In 1716, it was moved to another place in the same church. In 1794, his bones were moved to the Hospital de Jesus, founded by Cortes, 
where a statue by Tulsa and a mausoleum were made. There was a public ceremony and all the churches in the city rang their bells. In 1823, after the independence of Mexico, it seemed imminent that his body would be desecrated, so the mausoleum was removed, the statue in the coat of arms was sent to Palermo, Sicily, to be protected by the Duke of Terranova. The bones were hidden, and everyone thought that they had been sent out of Mexico. In 1836, his bones were moved to another place in the same building. It was not until 1947 that they were rediscovered thanks to the discovery of a secret document by Lucas Alleman. His body put in charge of the Instituto Nacional de Antropologia e Historia INAH. It was authenticated and then restored to the same place, this time with a bronze inscription and his coat of arms. In 1981, when a copy of the bust by Tulsa was put in the church, there was a failed attempt to destroy his bones. Children Natural children of Hernan Cortes Doña Catalina Pizarro, born between 1514 and 1515 in Santiago de Cuba or maybe later in Nueva Hispana, daughter of Doña Leonor Pizarro, perhaps relative of Cortes, Don Martin Cortes, born in Coyoacan in 1522, son of Doña Marina, La Malinche, called the first mestizo. About him was written the new world of Martin Cortes. Married Doña Bernaldina de Porres and had two children. Doña Ana Cortes, Don Fernando Cortes, principal judge of Veracruz. Descendants of this line are alive today in Mexico. Doña Ana Cortes, Don Fernando Cortes, principal judge of Veracruz. Descendants of this line are alive today in Mexico. Don Luis Cortes, born in 1525, son of Doña Antonia or Elvira Hermosillo. Doña Leonor Cortes Moctezuma, born in 1527 or 1528 in Ciudad de Mexico, daughter of Aztec Princess Tequichpozin, baptized Isabel, born in Tenochtitlan on July 11, 1510 and died on July 9, 1550, the eldest legitimate daughter of Moctezuma to Zocoyozin and wife Doña Maria Miyuxarquitl. Married to Juan de Tolosa, a minor, Doña Maria Cortes de Moctezuma, daughter of an Aztec princess. Nothing more is known about her except that she probably was born with some deformity. He married twice, firstly in Cuba to Catalina Juarez Marida, who died at Coyoacan in 1522 without issue, and secondly in 1529 to Doña Joana Ramirez de Arilano de Zuniga, daughter of Don Carlos Ramirez de Arilano, second Count of Aguila and wife the Countess Doña Joana de Zuniga, and had Don Luis Cortes y Ramirez de Arilano, born in Texcoco in 1530 and died shortly after his birth. Doña Catalina Cortes de Zuniga, born in Cuernavaca in 1531 and died shortly after her birth. Don Martin Cortes y Ramirez de Arilano, second Marquis of the Valley of Oaxaca, born in Cuernavaca in 1532. Married at Nalda on February 24, 1548 his twice cousin once removed Doña Ana Ramirez de Arilano y Ramirez de Arilano and had issue, currently extinct in male line, Doña Maria Cortes de Zuniga, born in Cuernavaca between 1533 and 1536, married to Don Luis de Quinans y Pimentel, 5th Count of Luna, Doña Catalina Cortes de Zuniga, Born in Cuernavaca between 1533 and 1536, died unmarried in Sevilla after the funeral of her father, Doña Joana Cortes de Zuniga, born in Cuernavaca between 1533 and 1536, married Don Fernando Enriquez de Ribera y Porto Carrero, second Duke of Alcala de los Gazzles, third Marquis of Tarifa and sixth Count of Los Molos, and at issue. Disputed Interpretation of His Life there are relatively few sources to the early life of Cortés. His fame arose from his participation in the conquest of Mexico and it was only after this that people became interested in reading and writing about him. Probably the best source is his letters to the king which he wrote during the campaign in Mexico, but they are written with the specific purpose of putting his efforts in a favorable light and so must be read critically. Another main source is the biography written by Cortés's private chaplain López de Gomara which was written in Spain several years after the conquest. 
Gomara never set foot in the Americas and knew only what Cortes had told him, and he had an affinity for nightly romantic stories which he incorporated richly in the biography. The third major source is written as a reaction to what its author calls the lies of Gomara, the eyewitness account written by the conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo does not paint Cortes as a romantic hero but rather tries to emphasize that Cortes's men should also be remembered as important participants in the undertakings in Mexico. In the years following the conquest more critical accounts of the Spanish arrival in Mexico were written. The Dominican friar Bartolom de Luxas wrote his A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies which raises strong accusations of brutality and heinous violence towards the Indians. Accusations against both the conquistadors in general and Cortes in particular. The accounts of the conquest given in the Florentine Codex by the Franciscan Bernardino de Sahagun and his native informants are also less than flattering towards Cortes. The scarcity of these sources has led to a sharp division in the description of Cortes's personality and a tendency to describe him as either a vicious and ruthless person or a noble and honorable cavalier. Representations in Mexico In Mexico there are few representations of Cortes. However, many landmarks still bear his name, from the castle in the city of Cuernavaca to some street names throughout the Republic. The only authentic monuments are in Mexico City at the pass between the volcanoes Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatépetl, where Cortés took his soldiers on their march to Mexico City. It is known as the Paso de Cortés. The muralist Diego Rivera painted several representation of him but the most famous, depicts him as a powerful and ominous figure along with Malinche in a mural in the National Palace in Mexico City. In 1981. President López Portillo tried to bring Cortés to public recognition. First, he made public a copy of the bust of Cortés made by Manuel Tolsa in the Hospital de Jesus Nazareno with an official ceremony, but soon a nationalist group tried to destroy it, so it had to be taken out of the public. Today the copy of bust is in the Hospital de Jesus Nazareno while the original is in Naples, Italy, in the Villa Pignatelli. Later, another monument, known as Monumento al Mestizaje by Julian Martinez y M. Moldnado, was commissioned by López Portillo to be put in the Zocalo, main square, of Coyoacán, near the place of his country house, but it had to be removed to a little-known park, the Jardin Zicatum Cattle, Barrio de San Diego Churubusco, to quell protests. The statue depicts Cortés, Malinche and their son. There is another statue by Sebastian Aparicio, in Cuernavaca, was in a Hotel El Casino de la Selva. Cortés is barely recognizable, so it sparked little interest. The hotel was closed to make a commercial center, and the statue was put out of public display by Costco the builder of the commercial center. Writings, the Cartas de Relación Cortés' personal account of the conquest of Mexico is narrated in his five letters addressed to Charles V. These five letters, the Cartas de Relacion, are Cortés' only surviving writings. See Letters and Dispatches of Cortés, translated by George Folsom, New York, 1843. Prescott's Conquest of Mexico, Boston, 1843. And Sir Arthur Helps' His Life of Hernando Cortés, London, 1871 as one specialist describes them. His first letter is lost, and the one from the municipality of Veracruz has to take its place. It was published for the first time in Volume 4 of Documentos para la Historia de Hispana, and subsequently reprinted. The first Carta de Relacion is available online at the University of Wisconsin. The Segunda Carta de Relacion, bearing the date of October 30, 1520, appeared in print at Seville in 1522. The Carta Tercera, May 15, 1522, appeared at Seville in 1523. The fourth, October 20, 1524, was printed at Toledo in 1525. The fifth, on the Honduras Expedition, is contained in Volume 4 of the Documentos para la Historia de Hispana. The important letter mentioned in the text has been published under the heading of Carta Inedita de Cortés by a chat spalcita. A great number of minor documents either by Cortés or others, for or against him, 
are dispersed through the voluminous collection above cited and through the College Cienda Documentos de Indias, as well as in the Documentos para la Historia de Mexico of Ichat Spalsita. There are a number of reprints and translations of Cortes's writings into various languages. Ancestors <laughs>